Peter, good morning to you. Thank you for uh, joining me from uh, Paris today. It's a wonderful day here in Baltimore, and I'm sure it's a wonderful warm afternoon out there in Paris as well. Uh, before we get started, a few housekeeping things for our guests here that are joining us today. Um, please mute yourselves, um, and if you forget to do that, I will mute you um, just to keep the ambient noise out of um, the discussion here as well. If you have questions, comments, things you want to add, please use the chat feature. Um, I will monitor that and ask questions as appropriate or interject different comments uh, as needed. The purpose of this talk uh, is to go over the seaweed sector. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Andrew Rose. Uh, my background was in capital markets for farm credit, and I um, worked on most of the, uh, the novel plant protein uh, deals that came through, so I had good visibility into the um, microalgae, which is the tiny little pieces of algae, and the, the macroalgae, which is seaweed, was a little bit outside of my uh, sphere of understanding. But since le leaving Farm Credit, I now have the ability to um, talk to those people, like Peter Green here, who is a renowned worldwide expert on seaweed. Um, and Peter has agreed to sit down and, and kind of open the books for us and let us know what the the state of the industry is and give us some tidbits. And for those of you who may be investors or no investors, um, pay close attention because he's going to drop some, we hope, or some golden nuggets there for things to keep an eye on. Uh, but anyway, regardless, Peter is is our encyclopedia here. And Peter, I, I guess, well, basically, I mean, who are you and why seaweed? And how did it take you to be sitting in Paris right now? Mm. Yeah, thanks for having me, Andrew. So a bit of context, a bit of background about me. I studied biotechnology and biochemistry in London, at Imperial College London, uh, where I was introduced to the role of algae for bioremediation, biofuels, uh, hydrocarbons, uh, and sort of the latter of the, the hydrocarbon production uh, using microalgae was my thesis. So that's how I dived into algae in general. And then when I went to Australia, I started helping out with some teams who were bioplastic startups and feed startups. We were using macroalgae to create yeah, a variety of different products. And so that during that period, I noticed that I couldn't find, I couldn't stay up to date with the latest news. I didn't know what was going on. And I think there was a lot of folks at that time, three or four years ago, that were really struggling with the same problem. So we had people like Stephen Hermans from Phyconomy who started blogging about the space. He has a great newsletter. And uh, I, at the same time, started just journaling and writing about news updates, market updates, research updates that I found interesting and then spoke to, you know, well over 200 people in the industry over the last couple of years to get down to the nitty gritty uh, about what this biomass is, what it can do and, and what we can build with it. And then, yeah, Pakistan now has a newsletter that services well over a thousand different subscribers uh, across investors, climate investors. Um, entrepreneurs, operators, and academics. And we basically want to serve as a business and development tool, which helps people stay on top of the trends and deploy capital to, to grow uh, the seaweed and microalgae industries. So the last year, I also started working with Hatch Blue, and we wrote a big, which is an aquaculture fund, and we wrote a big seaweed report for the World Bank um, called the Global Seaweed Report. And that dive into 10 emerging uh, products and, and markets for seaweed that we think could be quite big in the next 10 years. And that should be coming out in the next couple of weeks and months. Um, and with the same goal of, of helping uh, governments and investors deploy capital and uh, operators build. Good. <laughs> And, and, and well, I mean, we, we talked about this prior to folks joining us, but why Paris? Why Paris? Uh, my partner lives there, for one. That's one, one reason. And secondly, I was saying before, like, I, I'm, I lived near Oxford for a while, the last couple of years after getting back from Australia, and then recognised that I wanted to be in London or Paris for the ecosystem. So that the French and the Dutch are, are really quite are leading in Europe with the, the seaweed and algae industries, it seems. Um, there's been a lot of movements from this part of the world to, to develop the seaweed industry. And so being here has been a really good opportunity to connect with the right people who are both building and looking to invest. 
and it's a bit of a hub for people passing through Europe. So in a couple of weeks, we've got uh, folks like Arija from Eager from Australia passing through, and recently we had guys from New Zealand and the US who were just coming through to meet a whole bunch of folks. So it's a really good place. Well, good. Um, well, I'll jump right into it. The headlines these days about seaweed, it's almost, I mean, you see it in the mainstream headlines as well. Everyone's discovered that if you feed seaweed to cows, they tend to fart burp less, and that then will reduce methane. So it appears that everyone who was able to scratch together a seed investment or friends and family or what have you is feeding seaweed to cows at this point in time. But looking at this chart here, there's a lot of other things that we can do rather than just feeding seaweed to cows. But before we go into that, what are your thoughts about using um, seaweed as a methane reduction tool for livestock? Yeah, I think o over the course of the last few years, there has been a lot of interest in this application. And I I've always been very uh, passionate about it uh, because the, the demand for the incentive from from uh, farmers is, is quite big, right? So we're seeing a clear demand for the, the product. Um, and the potential is not only with things like asparagopsis supplements, it's, it's not only in methane reduction, but also some feed conversion benefits. So um, the potential impact is quite big. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm always, I, I love to see uh the the finances and the capital going into solving the challenges in this space because i mean compared to some of the other product categories the kegas of the, the growth rate of methane reduction is quite high because of that deployment of capital folks are really keen to solve challenges that we might run into in this space um technical challenges and whatnot um so yeah it's very exciting i think that there are a few challenges in terms of species uh the species that we can farm and um, for example asparagopsis is not native to many regions so teams are looking at things like sugar kelp as an alternative um in europe anyway but asparagopsis remains the highest reduction potential as far as i'm aware uh, and so the guys who are doing land-based farming of, of asparagopsis down in, in in australia and new zealand but also in europe we have folks like volta green tech are doing some really good work and and in Vietnam, guys like greener grazing as well have been doing some really good work to close the life cycle so that we can um, just improve the scale up of supply. Because supply is a big question here is how can we get enough seaweed to farmers across the globe to, to have that impact? Um, well, that's one of the challenges. The other challenges include price points. So in my conversations over the last few years, it's clear farmers don't necessarily want to pay up to you know twenty dollars us dollars to 30 us dollars initially for for per kilogram for these additives um over time that's expected to come down maybe in the range of ten dollars per kilogram like similar other additives that have health benefits for for cattle um but yeah that's one question that potentially folks are turning to regulators and governments to try and um, create tax breaks and, and subsidize the the introduction of this additive. But on the whole, yeah, the, the, the product is really exciting and uh, has a lot of potential to reduce methane by, I think, between 60 and 80 or maybe even 90%. Um, and so they're just carrying out a few of those trials at the moment and in larger scale. And I think the guys down in Australia um, came up with some, some uh trials recently that were large scale and that was yeah that was one of the big questions as well is can they they can do it in the lab they can do it on a small scale but can they do it on a large scale and as far as i'm aware they, they've started to address some of those concerns um so on the whole very exciting when you're talking about the people in australia and new zealand you're talking about steve and ch4 yeah, exactly steve ch4 uh who might be on the call i mean i've spoken to steve a few times really knowledgeable guy and and very i think What's important with Steve is that he ha he maintains the vision of the the, the problem. He, he keeps the problem in mind at all times. So, you know, the scale of climate change and so the the need to push solutions that actually um, fix it, uh, and that's something that really resonates with with me, but also investors on the whole. Um, otherwise. I mean, Steve's, yeah, I, th I think CH4 Global are also looking into the States. I'm not entirely sure that's accurate, but there's a few teams in the States as well that um, are building 
methane reduction supplements companies, um, Blue Ocean Barns and, and Symbrosia in Hawaii, really uh, cool teams that are all pushing for the same thing. Um, and, and yeah, I think there's a few challenges in the States that are worth talking about in, in terms of regulation. Um, that's when I last spoke to guys like Daria from, from um, I can't remember, Alga Biosciences, there were questions around the, the, the FDA's approval of certain uh, seaweeds. Are they going to use it as a drug? Are they going to use it as it's synthetic? Um, but actually, that's something that I'm not super knowledgeable about. I just recognize that regulation might be a challenge for some guys in this space. Um, but yeah, we're, 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 we're yet to see. And I guess that's where broadening awareness comes in as a solution. Can we animate uh, regulators? Can we animate the right stakeholders and, and uh, people who lead in government to, to, to introduce these products? I, one of the other sectors I follow is cell-based meat. And that's the, the creation of mammalian tissue within a fermentation or bioreactor tank. And the one place in the planet that's leading the world is Singapore. And what they did early on was they invited the regulators in the labs with them. So they helped write the regulations in there. So it's kind of like having a teacher over your shoulder while you're taking the test, give you the answers. So it was a very frictionless um, regulatory regime. I wonder if there are certain lessons that the, the macroalgae sector can learn, at least domestically, about inviting the regulators in rather than trying to do everything and hoping to pass the test. Yeah, I think completely, you're completely right there. We are, we are seeing some really good progress with keeping seaweed in the public discourse. So we're seeing a lot of guys um, like Vincent and, and the Seaweed Manifesto guys, um, Safe Seaweed Coalition, who now become like a global seaweed coalition. They're really keeping people talking about it. I, I'm seeing so many Guardian articles now in the UK covering more and more detailed topics in seaweed, which is quite fun to see. And, and that's really important too, because in, in the West, um, in, in contrast with Asia, a lot of change comes from the, the, the public, right? So if, if we can get it more, get more people talking about these different products, then we're more likely to see regulatory changes flowing up from the bottom. Whereas in Asia, you, you're more likely to Apparently, according to some folks I've spoken to, you're more likely to, to change the system by having conversations with government officials and, and regulators. Um, so it's slightly different depending on, on the, the geography, uh, but always important to engage those regulators as soon as possible. And, and awareness is, is always a big, a big problem. Um, every conversation I have with startups who are slightly more developed, perhaps not quite early stages, but selling products, um, is can we raise awareness uh, that's a huge topic that i'm trying to fix alongside of a whole bunch of different guys is we're trying to keep it talked about with the right people keep sharing success stories uh, and yeah as i said before uh, distinguishing signal from noise uh, so we can really just push great teams great products that are not overselling on on uh, inaccurate solutions I mean, a question I have for you, I, mean, I know our domestic market pretty well and what the acceptance is going to be. And I've got a sense of what the European market is going to be, but I really don't know what the, the end usage in the Asian markets would, would be. Is it for uh, human consumption? Are there other applications that, that they're exploring or using? What can we learn from how they're um, using macroalgae? I think a Asia, as the biggest product producer of, of CV globally, we're seeing the breakdown is food is the number one. And then additives, food additives, things like um, heterogenin that go into different food products or pet food products. And then also um, a few guys are making cosmetics. It's kind of an emerging, it's not emerging, it's been around a while, but seaweed's being more and more commonly used in cosmetics over there. And I remember coming up with a chart not long ago showing like the mad growth of of cosmetic searches, uh, seaweed cosmetic searches in Asia. So it's a really hot topic right now. Um, there is one other application of seaweed in Asia that's not coming to mind right now, but yeah, food is the, is the big one and uh, where most of global production goes into food in Asia. Good, and, and you know, I'm gonna throw this one out there to start with and we'll kind of work towards the more um, easier to market uh, applications. I've heard that seaweed is also a really 
could be a leather substitute, but I've also heard in practice it's not quite there yet. Um, are there some companies that we should keep an eye on that could have some applications in the future? And, and kind of what's your take on using uh, some seaweed uh, particles or uh, different parts for leather? I, I, I love the, the bio-based material teams. It's a, it's a really exciting area that resonates with a lot of people. The problems that are, are arising is the cost of production. Can you get enough seaweed to have an impact on supply chains? Um, competition from alternative sustainable uh, products is, is always an issue. And we are seeing, there has been a few guys over the years that have been making um, seaweed derived extracts in fabrics. So things like lysocell has been around for a while and it's likely to increase over the, over the years. Um, but, and there's also a transition away from, from sort of just using it as a, as a simple, small ingredient in, in fabrics and turning it into a larger bulk sort of ingredient so that all, the, all products are made from, from seaweed. Um, and they're, they're, there's very strong drivers as well in that area. So increased regulatory pressure, increased market pressure in the fashion industry, the big drivers from consumers trying to, who want to wear seaweed, uh, basically things that don't have a big impact on the environment. And yeah, corporate sustainability targets as well really are driving that, that sector. Uh, it's yet to see if we can get enough of it. Basically, that's one of the big questions, especially in the West. Like if you're if you're introduce, if you're making these products, you need to get enough seaweed close to your target market instead of shipping it all the way across the world. So uh, teams that are looking at using wild harvested seaweed locally or just trying to scale up seaweed locally, that's the future in this in this sector. And actually across the board, like it's very, this is one of the big things about the seaweed industry is that we need to increase supply to service these products um, in the West uh, because it, Asia already has a big market that mostly goes to food. If you're going to introduce, get more seaweed um, for different products, there's, there's a lot of competition for that biomass. In the West, we have, in Europe, we have less than a thousand tons, I think, of seaweed harvested, uh, cultivated um, for different products, which is very, very low. Um, and just to give you an example, if, you, if you're talking to a team like Nestle or uh, TSM or Cargill, they want to. They want in the thousands of tons, basically. So that's how much seaweed they want for different pet food products, um, and that's not available close to home for a lot of different uh, product development teams. And so, one of the key challenges over the next few years will be how do we scale up sustainably? How what kind of finance can we can we provide these teams? Because a lot of investors want to invest in very tech focused product development teams, um, whereas seaweed is not necessarily as sexy or, or uh, the, the, mar the potential margins are not as massive as making a, a product, a fucosanthin product, or, sorry, a cordon product uh, or pharmaceutical products. So, so yeah, that, that's a big question. And I think getting more big institutional investors involved uh, to finance those things and perhaps look at financial, yeah, different financial instruments to support these farmers will be really important um, going forward because yeah, they can't do it all. That's what we've seen. Um, there's just not enough supply. Well, uh, one of our uh, listeners here has asked a question. Oh, I to, I, Andrew, you've cut out for me. I'm just wondering if that's my signal. Yep. Well, hey, did, did you, did I lose oh, my internet yeah. connection? Is unstable here, it seems like. I lost <laughs> you there. I lost you there. That, that's fine. I'm, I'm actually going to switch over to my, um, to my hotspot. Um, just quickly, um, what about the, um, the seaweed that's floating towards Florida right now? Couldn't we use that as a supply? Yeah, absolutely. This is a really interesting topic for a lot of different guys in the space. I think one of the important parts about this topic is that you're getting use of a biomass that's causing problems, right? So 
for the tourism industry, it's affecting tourism in Florida and, and Mexico, for example. It's suffocating coral reefs um, and, and killing a lot of animals out there because it's just, it's, it's out of control. There's too many nutrients that it, it's growing on. It, it really enjoys the current climate. Um, and so, yeah, definitely when one of the things with seaweed is that you see a lot of guys trying to push solutions as opposed to solving problems, right? So yes, it's great, seaweed's a great solution, but are, can you, are you directly solving a pain point? And so the guys that are tackling sargassum invasion, really, really important for a lot of people. So in terms of products, there's so many different things we can make from it. And, and one of the, um, I think, I mean, you mentioned Carbon Wave already. I think that they're one of the top guys that are looking at this topic. And everyone I speak to, although I've never actually spoken to the Carbon Wave guys, everyone I speak to mentions Carbon Wave. So they're doing some really great work in this space. Um, and there's a lot of other guys as well who are looking at valorizing it, uh, turning it into different types of uh, materials, but also potentially uh, turning it into biogas and, and um, carbon sequestration tools. So, I mean, just a, a small example, there's a couple of teams looking at making cardboard from sargassum. There's teams looking at making construction materials like bricks. Um, and, and this is really important. There's also some companies making biostimulants from, from sargassum, which is another interesting topic. I, I've heard that he's got, a, one of those companies got a very good, he's making a lot of money basically, uh, shifting that, 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 that biomass and turning it into agricultural inputs for farmers on remote islands in, in the Caribbean. Um, but I haven't actually done a big deep dive into sargassum's use cases of biostimulant because some folks I've spoken to say that it's very, it's useless. Um, admittedly, a lot of those guys saying that are trying to sink it in the bottom of the ocean for carbon sequestration, so they, you'd expect them to say that, whereas other guys are, are telling me that it, it actually has a lot of potential as a, as a biostimulant and, and different products like that. Um, and this sort of is another big topic in the industry that we have to keep in mind is this, the, the disagreement between carbon sequestration sinking of sargassum for blue carbon credits versus utilizing this biomass as a you know a source of interesting um, materials and, and inputs for different products. And I apologize about the activity here. Um, I read recently that Japan was um, seeing a downturn in their seaweed farming. What, what what's the cause of that? Is it climatic? Is it yeah. consumer demand? What what is it? I didn't, I, I saw that too. I didn't go too, de too deep into why. I'm imagining as with a lot of places around the world for so the last 10 years, we've seen a, a steep, not well, a relatively steep decline in, in total seaweed farmed and output. And I think that's largely to do with climate, climate change and, and very, but there's always been variability in seaweed production. Uh, but yeah, climate is one of the big talking points. Um, yeah, some seaweeds don't respond too well to changes in, in carbon in, in the ocean. Um, and I think, but I, I think I saw a headline today that China's seen an increase in some regions uh, of their seaweed output. So yeah, the Japan one was a bit of an interesting talk about because I think it was 50% reduction. Um, I'm not entirely sure how much of a headline that was just to, to gain sort of attention or sort of raise hysteria, but yeah. Yeah, it's, it's an important thing to bear in mind. There will be a challenge going forward. Um, supply, stability of supply, variability in composition of seaweeds um, because of seasonality it is very important um, for, for scaling the industry going forward. Now, I'm an armchair scientist. I never went to school for this, but I did hear that with the ocean sequestering more carbon, that's lowering the pH and creating a more hospitable environment to grow seaweed but i imagine that there's going to be a, a boundary you know once it exceeds yeah. that boundary then it, then we start to see a decline right now and from at least my armchair scientist point of view it seems like we're in a sweet spot that this would be the time for proliferation of uh, folks that want to grow macroalgae and seaweed um but again i don't that that's yeah. my my armchair science into the real world gets it, yeah i think there's there is a line there that um, in, in fact, I'm not an expert on, on acidification on, on, on growing seaweed. I know that some kelps 
I, well, from what I, I remember, that a lot of them favor alkalines are slightly above seven, um, pH seven. So generally we don't want to get too acidic. So if there's, if there's too much carbon in the ocean, then um, it's not great either for seaweed. Uh, but some kelps, according to, I remember speaking to Charlie Arish not long ago, Professor Charlie Arish, and I think he he's mentioned something about some kelps responding pretty well to, to lower pH as compared to other forms of biomass. So in terms of ocean grown biomass, I think there's a lot, there is generally a lot of potential for farming seaweed as a solution to the ocean acidification question. It is a solution, it result, it can fix um, highly acidic uh, waters for sure. Well, that's good to know. I mean, everyone wants a crop that you don't have to fertilize or water. You just put a seed in there and the thing grows up. That's fantastic. Um, We've got a, a, a specific question here in the chat box, and it has to do with um, what are some of the biggest challenges facing scaling up the seaweed sector in the UK in particular? Yeah, that's a great question. I think uh, from what I've gathered, um, actually, I get this question a lot nowadays because I am English and people expect me to know this, but uh, you know, I don't spend that as much time as I'd like to on the UK. I think that's something that's done is being done really well now. Is the, they've been a couple of reports commissioned to find out the answers to this. But I can give you what I sort of gathered from conversations. And, and one thing is uh, price points. So we're seeing a lot of product development teams come to farmers and sort of flip flap between buying and not buying. They're kind of going between different farmers saying, "Can you give me a bit of seaweed?" but no one's really putting in purchase orders to farmers. So farmers are really upset from what I've gathered. Uh, there's a, and across the board in Europe in general, like there's a big gap between developers and, and farmers, unless you're vertically integrated. Um, they like to be kept in the dark, right, the farmers. And so that's something that's upsetting them because they don't know where the demand's coming from. Um, and that's one of the topics we have a lot of, we've seen a lot of seaweed just teams sitting on inventory so seaweed farmers sitting on seaweed that they don't really know where to, where, to, where it's going to go and so that would be one of the big um, issues facing the industry is in, in the UK is is getting really clear on the demand um, making farmers feel comfortable with the demand and putting those purchase orders in place uh, purchasing tons of seaweed at a time uh, and not driving down prices too low so that it's just not affordable to farm um that's what that's what comes to mind right now there's obviously a few other challenges i mean processing pre-processing is a big challenge um you need to have there's a couple of processing processing teams in scotland um, and there's a couple of guys developing mobile processes that can be shipped around the country um across the uk to to dry seaweed and pre-process it for further processing um but that's still a work in progress. Um, and yeah, that's something I'd like to see de being developed over the next few years or so is, is that. I think there's also issues with standardization of farming, site selection. Um, but yeah, I'll probably be better on better place to answer that question in, in a month or so. Um, I think there's gonna be a few guys developing uh, some good projects. One of the things I'm familiar yeah. with here in Baltimore, we have the Chesapeake Bay. And there's a lot of leased water to grow oysters in. Um, is that a, a similar, I guess, in the UK or around the world? I mean, where are we all on, on that? Or is it just you go out and plant your seeds and don't know and take yeah, your seaweed? Yeah. Actually, that's a really good point. I, I forgot to mention that licensing, uh, not licensing, leasing, permitting is a huge issue. And you have big problems with competition for ocean space uh, in the UK, especially. And we have a lot of coastlines, but we have a lot of coastline, but it's not. Um, you know, there's a lot of competition for that that space with fishing and whatnot. I think something that we're seeing at the moment, which is quite exciting for the UK, is wind wind farms, and uh, that's something that you, the Netherlands has been pushing. North Sea farmers are doing a really good job with looking into seaweed farming under wind turbines, and that's something that a lot of guys are really excited about because it gives a social license to both, you know. Put more wind farms in the water but also grow seaweed because wind farms for a lot of people are, are quite ugly especially guys living on the coast they don't really want to see these big wind turbines out on the ocean as brilliant as they are but if they know that there's seaweed that could be farmed underneath that there's it does something for the attitude towards uh, the actual scale up of wind energy 
um, because generally, right. you know, well, maybe want to have a little bit of right. What? So yeah, we were creating jobs and whatnot. So that's something that's really exciting as well. Um, but yeah, licensing is a big problem. If it can be done in 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 vicinity of shellfish farming, and we can create more polycultures and stuff like that, that's really really important. Um, because that's and I think that's something that a lot of guys are looking into as well. Because obviously there's a lot of uh, extraction potential for bioremediation um, in the ocean. So. Um, yeah, but I'm not an expert on on shellfish at, at all. So, uh, yeah, good question. But I, I like your poly farming comment there because it was years ago, probably four years ago, I met a barramundi farmer from Australia, and he was doing net pen barramundi, but doing it in a rotational sense. So the effluent then would fertilize the, the seabed, and he would grow kelp there during the rotational piece. And the nice thing about wind farms is they've got an exclusionary zone around those shipping traffic and go in there mm -hmm. but if you can do net pen farming in there as well as kelp production and then do the the long cords of mussel and other um, mm -hmm. shellfish you can really utilize that space and you know going back to just confirming what you just said it could it could be a really nice poly farming opportunity there yeah absolutely um yeah I, I, one thing to note as well is the biodiversity benefit of seaweed i, I was in, in bristol not long ago and they were talking about the the benefits of putting wind farms in in general for for increasing um, stocks of local fish in those regions uh, and so seaweed it can add to that and bring back some of the sort of the loss of biodiversity and species that we've seen but that sort of raises other questions of things like biofouling because uh, i think that there's been like some increases in populations of things like cormorants because of too many fish now and so fishermen are getting upset because their, their ships are getting rusted by sort of uh, the the droppings of this these cormorants but i'm not sure that's a, a major scale up problem it's just a, another thing to think about they are interesting birds if you ever study them that's for sure <laughs> <laughs> well you now this is an area that i don't have as much exposure in and that's the the health and beauty cosmetics um side of applications of, of seaweed can you talk a little bit about that um and i'm i'm sure you've read some consumer trials some outcomes there both positive and negative. Are there certain companies in that space to keep an eye on, certain trends we need to watch? Yeah, uh, in terms of companies, so starting with pharmaceuticals, I think, right? So there's a lot of potential with using different extracts from seaweed as a pharmaceutical, as pharmaceuticals, but generally teams in this space are in the pre-clinical pre phases and we're not seeing um, total acceptance yet of these products coming from seaweed. Um, there are actually some use cases of seaweed being used at scale, but um, based on our analysis, yeah, it's going to be 10 years or so before we see big production of pharmaceuticals from seaweed, specifically pharmaceuticals. There are obviously lots of nutraceuticals that we can make from seaweed that have health benefits. And actually something that everyone's been talking about is things like sea moss in the States. I know that's had like a lot of uptick recently um, in some, some regions. Um, because of several, I think, antioxidant benefits, dietary benefits, health benefits. Um, but yeah, there, there's always issues with quality control, certification, uh, regulatory problems are gonna, you know, they stall these industries a fair bit. So deploying a lot of capital, uh, while it's very exciting, deploying a lot of capital on the hope of, of getting a pharmaceutical product in the market is, is very risky uh, at this stage. Um, and there's, challenges of quality, consistency of supply, as well as species um, seasonality. Uh, it, the variability, of, depending on the, the, the season, is, is quite big. So some teams are looking at growing seaweed on land to ensure consistency of supply. Um, but yeah, that's that has issues with scaling, right? And, and the ecosystem service benefits will be limited as well by doing that. And then, yeah, the other thing you mentioned was cosmetics. I, 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 cosmetics are really exciting. Um, I don't know if you can hear me still, Andrew, you've frozen, but, um, oh no, there you are. Okay, cosmetics are really exciting. I, I've actually been tracking this for a while and um, it seems every single product uh, has seaweed in it. And for good reason, like it does have antioxidant benefits. Um, and there are certain other studies that show different benefits for your skin. Um, and it, what, one of the big things about this is that seaweed has this sort of green premium aspect to it. So if you include it in your product, you can 
animate your consumers to buy into sustainability, regenerative farming, uh, we're good for the ocean kind of thing. And a lot of that's true. So demand is, is really increasing, it seems in this area, perhaps there's some cosmetics teams in this listening who, who disagree with that. But what I've seen in, in Asia is particularly, there's, there's been an uptick there. And so um, I, I can't necessarily remember the team that a couple of big organizations were looking at um, cosmetics recently using seaweed, I can't remember the names, um, pharmaceutical and nutraceutical equally not off the top of my head I have to do a bit of a, a deep dive quickly I, I can pull that up actually quickly in a second and, and give you some names yeah or we could send a follow-up email as well to, to the folks that have watched this um and I, you may have mentioned it when my, my internet blip there um because a lot of people might not realize that there's already seaweed and a lot of things that they're either consuming or using every single day so there is there is a huge demand for at least that part of the, the plant to be utilized. You, I don't know if you discussed that or not, but if you didn't, could you touch on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, seaweed is, is used, has been used for ages in different products. Um, in, I, I mean, strictly talking about, uh, you know, things like biostimulants, for example, they've been around for a long time. Uh, fertilizers have had seaweed in them for ages, um, decades, you know, centuries. We, people have been eating seaweed and, and giving it as a food additive, feed additive for cattle. Cosmetics, we, you know, we've we've seen things like um, I think fucoidin has been around for a while actually in, in cosmetics, but I'm not entirely sure. But things like alginates and, and hydrocolloids, uh, yeah, they're they're everywhere. I mean, I think there was a big uptick in hydrocolloid production for things like pet foods in the Actually, I'm not sure if it's entirely pet foods, but things like carrageenan or, or one of the hydrocolloids in the 1950s and 19, 1970s, there was a big push for demand. So we saw um, East Asian countries start to really up, upscale their production of or extraction of these hydrocolloids for different products. So this is a massive industry. It's a massive market. It's been around for ages. And they're steadily, they are steadily growing year on year, these, these industries. I think not as sexy kegas like, uh, methane reduction supplements or um, things like um, not, maybe not animal feeds but things like cosmetics very high kegas in comparison but three to five percent growth on growth year on year um, it's that's what we've gauged yeah um, it's a good place to put your money um, one of the other places here too that which I'm really excited to have but have you on this call here is industrial applications. You know, when I think of industrial applications, I'm thinking of like hempcrete, you know, making a, a concrete substitute or making blocks or bricks out of this. But I'm sure there's a whole lot of other things I'm not even thinking about for industrial applications or possibilities that are out there. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I've i been following, strictly talking about construction, right? I've been following this industry for a long time, the, the role of potentially putting seaweed into construction materials. Uh, and because we have the added benefit of sequestration, for example, in some of these products. So if you construction buildings last anywhere from 20 to even up to 100 years, so you can temporarily sequester carbon in, in these products for a short time frame, um, assuming you put enough seaweed into the products, right? Because you need a lot of it to, to scale up um, this application to have an impact uh, on, on climate change. Beyond concrete, we've, we've obviously got a lot of solvents that we can make from paints that we can make from seaweed. That's a really interesting space. Although we see mostly dyes, I think coming from microalgae, um, macroalgae has a lot of potential as well in, in paints and, and exteriors. And a lot of that is derived from the same sort of hydrocolloid use case. So things that we use to make plastic, bioplastics, we can also, also use in a range of different um, products in construction and industrial um, processes. The, uh, actually, touching on bioplastics, this is another area that's quite relevant to in industry, like interior design, architecture. If you can, uh, I mean, bioplastics can have potentially higher price points as niche applications in interior design and architecture. That's that's a really interesting space because, in the short term, uh, one of the things that puts a lot of investors off with seaweed for this industry is the price right commodity price uh, materials sell for very very low you've got to compete with oil 
you've got to introduce this this biomass into various supply chains that are already very established and not very welcoming to, to new materials. But if you target niche applications that resonate with consumers like um, seaweed, like there's a team called Blue Blue Blocks, no, not Blue, yeah, Blue Blocks based out of the Netherlands, I think, and she, um, Mar Mar uh, Marianne's been looking at using seaweed as a sort of insulating, not insulating material, but like a, a material that you plug on your wall and you use as a as a sort of soundproofing agent and a, a bit of interior style, styling. Bioplastics as well, like you can create walls and panels out of bioplastics. It's really um, potentially more lucrative in the short term. And then beyond that, you can start to, to target more day-to-day -day objects that um, make it feasible economically and attractive to investors. Uh, but that's the biggest question I think I have with, with in, in big industries is, is can you make enough seaweed so that you can bring the prices down to actually service the, the need? You, you're going to rely on green premiums in the meantime. And not everyone, it's not always realistic to assume people are going to pay that um, because they generally don't and, and people's interests they change very quickly um, and so yeah I'm not super yeah I think it's important to for teams to develop niche applications that have slightly more interesting Tesla style um, business models where you have an interesting offering that's compelling and then beyond that you start to tackle bigger issues like bioenergy um, biofuel production um, yeah, it's very it's a very challenging industry to, to break down. Well, that's that's fantastic insight there. One of the things looking at your chart here that I was unexpected to me is the, the proliferation of nonprofits that support this sector. And I would assume some of them are advocates, some of them are protectionists. Um, kind of, can you give me a, a broad stroke of, of who the nonprofits are and what they're trying to accomplish out there? Yeah, yeah, I think. One name, a couple of names that really resonate here is Green Wave and Ocean Rainforest. Although I didn't really realize that Ocean Rainforest were a nonprofit, but Green Wave, for example, they are really intent on, on scaling supply. So, uh, for example, they're subsidizing farmers with uh, early stage certificates for carbon sequestration and, and um, nitrate removal from oceans. Because that's something that we haven't seen yet is the valorization of these ecosystem services that are provided by seaweed but haven't been taken advantage of haven't been really they haven't got markets um, available markets for them just yet and so a lot of these teams are looking at subsidizing those activities in the meantime um, just because the problem of climate change needs addressing right now and so if we wait before these market models are, are actually built uh, it might be for a lot of people. It might be too late. There's the the general consensus along amongst a lot of these nonprofits. Um, otherwise, UTS, for example, is the. I mean, I think it's university, but they they fund a lot. They have a great green accelerator program down there. They have a great team led by Professor Peter Ralph doing some really great work in, in algae in general. Uh, CSIRO equally is one of those those academic. Uh, organizations that's been really helping with for example methane reduction supplements and I think they had the um, or perhaps it wasn't them that has the patent but they were part of the research team that came sort of pushed the the, the methane reduction anti-methanogenic properties of, of asparagopsis so yeah I mean there's a whole range of different things but uh, one of the other things that's been happening is a lot of these guys are very research focused so um, I know Bigelow Labs uh, there's a lot of teams looking at getting the data in place so that we can then start shipping some of those other ecosystem services like carbon reduction um, and, and push things like deep ocean sequestration so they're really involved in in getting that data there so that we can actually start to justify some of the claims um, and that's another challenge that we're currently facing is that mrv so measurement reporting verification isn't there necessarily for carbon sequestration potential of seaweed uh, there's a lot of teams like oceans 2050 that have been doing seems to have been doing really great work and they're all quite bullish on the what's going to happen in the next five years or so um, and when i talk to them yeah it seems great like there's there is a lot of sequestration potential they have set up 
so they have data showing that the, the deposition of carbon under the sediments has it can be measured and can be valorized but we're waiting for uh, more data and and, uh, and then we can start potentially seeing credits for this but yeah that's a uh, the ecosystem services is another topic that's very it's a bit of a black box but the next five ten years will be quite important uh, from these research teams to really push out that information so teams can start scaling up um, their their offerings well and peter from from your vantage point here on top of pax tier and, and being the godfather of seaweed and, and the empire that you oversee here and um i'm sure there are a few companies Companies that you are keeping a close eye on, and that we might even see Paxteer deploying some of their own capital and getting behind. I know we've talked about CH4 and Carbon Wave and a few others. What at Blue Blocks? What are a couple of companies that we really should keep an eye on, regardless of which segment they're servicing? Yeah, I think um, I'm very. I think I've already mentioned a couple of teams that you say that I'm really happy, excited about. It's really hard to pick. Um, I love a lot of the teams and founders working in the space. We're seeing a lot of great founders now entering the industry, which is quite exciting. Um, but some examples, for example, would be teams like Oceanium in Scotland, um, teams like Blue Pet Co. In, 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 I think they're in Ireland or Scotland who are making pet food products. Oceanium's are, the biorefinery teams are really exciting. This is a really important part of the value chain. These guys who are creating these biorefineries that can create a whole different uh, series of products from one input from, from seaweed. So uh, this is one way that we can valorize different aspects of seaweed and, and create more value for product for product developers. And so guys like Macro Ocean is a really, really great team um, and Blue Evolution as well. Really, uh, I really like those guys. In terms of bioremediation, uh, which is when you use land-based bioremediation where you grow seaweed on land to, to filter out uh, pollutants and also waste in water. Uh, there's, there's a couple of teams in, in Australia and New Zealand who are doing some really cool work here like Aquacuro. Um, and yeah, there's a couple of others, Pacific Bio, I think they're still called Pacific Bio, a really interesting team in that space. That's quite an exciting area over the next 10, 15 years, uh, because you can grow seaweeds like over and create a whole host of different feeds or foods from treated water, uh, wastewater from fish farms, for example. And um, that's a lot of potential there. Methane reduction has so many, has really impressive teams. You've already mentioned CH4, Symbrosia, Green Grazing. Um, I like the founders in this space, uh, really uh, impressive teams and, and really good at animating. And then some of my others, I mean, Cascadia in Canada, really cool team, great, um, doing great things, building animal feed products and, and I think biostimulants as well. And that, that's a category that I find really interesting is as well, is those guys like Seaweed Company, Cascadia, who are going after, after things like animal feed products, biostimulants that can, can create revenue in, in the next two years, in the next year, two years that can finance expansion of seaweed for different use cases and products. So they're not, their, their business model is not reliant on excessive investment to tackle things like uh, deep sea sinking uh, and whatnot. They're really going after those near term markets that can create capital and, and, and create impact quickly. Bi Bioplastics has a lot of really cool teams. Um, I think there's guys like NotPLA, Ulu down in Australia, been doing some really cool work. There's a couple of guys like Kelpie, uh, and I know some others like Flexi are trying to raise capital at the moment. So if you want to deploy some capital in this space, that's a team that are looking for some money at the moment, and they're they're really they're, they're really hard workers. So I quite like those two, that team too. And yeah, there's so many more carbon weight. I couldn't list them all basically. Well, I mean, you do raise a good point there. So any investors that might listen to this before you deploy any capital, I would encourage you to call Peter, email him, ask him for his thoughts, engage him as a consultant to make sure that your diligence is done properly or you're not chasing a headline, but you're actually making a sound investment there. Uh, Peter, you, you've, you've been incredibly open about sharing all this information to our audience here. What are some things the audience can do for you? How can we, how can we support what you're doing? What, what are some ways that we can get behind you? And thank you for your information here. 
honestly i'd love to have more conversations with folks so if you just reach out and and let me know what you're working on what your problems are your pain points that's that's literally perfect that's what i want i want to know everyone and what their issues are and how i can help um so that's the goal right now with pakistan is just to try and service more folks which would be facilitated with just more conversations so yeah and i should know this where did the name pakistan come from pakistan it was really hard to pick a name for me, I mean, some guys have a lot of have ease with it, but I found it really challenging. And so we spent a while trying to come up with something. And so um, initially, my 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 goal was to service climate tech in general, so not just seaweed algae. Um, so the goal was to bring peace to the world with sort of climate tech solutions that can service people and planet. So we we turned to Latin, so Pax and and Tia, Terra. terra from Latin and so just brought them together. But yeah, people really struggle with this name. <laughs> like, no one knows how to say it most of the time, but uh, I love it. I still love it. And I, I think it rings well with the Paxi report, our newsletter. I think that resonates quite closely with a few of our subscribers. So yeah. Well, I, I like it a lot. I think if you're in the seaweed industry, you certainly know who it is. When I was talking to Jeremy at the crop project yesterday, I mentioned that we're going to this call. I said, oh, me next year i know him <laughs> so you're you're our, our legend within the industry that's for sure thanks andrew yeah there's a there's a lot more there's a lot of folks on this call as well that are legends as well like i think there's a lot of teams that you you know are doing some amazing work and i'm just a big fan that's basically what my role is i'm just a fan and i want to spread the message and, and help folks out and upscale up the industry support farmers support product developers um, and improve the content because there's, there's a bit of a deficit as well with like good content, good marketing in this space, uh, which is where people, we need people like you, Andrew, to sort of step in and start doing more webinars. <laughs> Absolutely. And well, you heard it here first, people. Peter is open to doing these with anybody. So give him a call, schedule it, make sure you're on France time or East Coast time to accommodate his needs. But uh, uh, any any final words here that you would like to, to share with both our audience in person as well as those viewing the recording later? Um, I think the, the the general thing is just keep going. I think for a lot of teams, this is a bit of a long long term play. So you've got to persist and expect it's going to play out in the next five, 10 years at least. Um, otherwise, yeah, keep going after those sort of big ambitions and the high value products as well. Um, that's that's something that I've sort of gauged over the last few years is that it can be a bit more challenging to, to finance some of those uh, lower value products that teams are pursuing in the, in the short term. But yeah, I mean, give me a call and we'll, we'll, we can flesh out a plan for, for how you can do that. Good. And I'm going to put another plug in here. If you don't subscribe to the Paxteer newsletter, go ahead and do it right now. It is fascinating. It's going to open up a whole new world of science that you may, might not have realized was there, but it is just a remarkable thing. Considering we're on a water planet, this is this is where we need to be. Cheers, Andrew. All right. Let me uh, see here. Okay. Let's see.